The incredible story of this sweet and charming old man is well known to almost every pilot in the Royal Air Force. This is Wing Commander Walter Taffy Holden, a former commanding officer of the 33rd Maintenance Unit at RAF Lynham. Taffy Holden remarkably went down in the history of the Royal Air Force as an engineer who accidentally took off in a jet fighter. I'm sure most of us, if not all of us, have dreamed of becoming a pilot at least once in our lives. We dream of jumping into the cockpit of a jet fighter and then swiftly soaring into the sky, leaving the ground behind. For some of us, that will remain a child's dream, while others will go through rigorous selection, then years of hard study and grueling training, so they can finally fulfill their dream and take off in a jet fighter. But Taffy Holden got that opportunity without even wanting it. In 1966, without being a pilot, by mere accidental mistake, Taffy flew in the fastest British fighter jet ever. This is one of those cases where the described events sound so incredible even by the standards of fictional stories. But the thing is that they all truly happened. To better understand the extent of the events, first, let me say a few words about the 60s and the fighter jet itself. The 1960s were perhaps one of the most intense years of the entire Cold War period. No sooner had the Berlin Crisis ended, rising the tensions between the Soviet Union and the USA to the extremely dangerous limit, than the world again found itself on the brink of World War III, now with the discovery of Soviet missiles in Cuba. Fortunately for both sides, nuclear war was avoided, but the very possibility of such a war between the USSR and the Western countries did not completely disappear. In the strategic plan of the possible future war, one of the most important roles belonged to the British Royal Air Force, in particular to the so-called V-Force, a fleet of strategic bombers with names beginning with the letter V, Valiant, Victor and Balkan. At the right moment, the bombers were set to take off from their airfields and unleash their devastating nuclear power on Soviet military targets. This is the destructive power. We pray God we will never be called upon to hurl at any nation. But this plan had one vulnerable point. The location of the military airfields were well known, so there was a high risk that the Soviets would simply destroy British airfields along with the planes on the ground in the first minutes of the war. Because of the geographical proximity, the Soviet planes, once detected, would only be a few minutes away from Great Britain. And after the Soviet Union began to develop new supersonic bombers, there would be a risk that even this time would be reduced to a critical minimum and the existing British air defenses would not be able to intercept enemy planes in such a short period of time. Two possible solutions to this problem were interceptor aircrafts and surface-to-air missile systems. But the problem was that in the early 50s the existing fighters did not have the necessary speed, particularly the time they required to take off and climb to intercept the target was very long and anti-aircraft missiles in their turn had a relatively short interception range. The British solution to the problem was, in a way, two-in-one. Want to fly a lightning and take your own thunder with you? The English Electric Lightning, the pride of British military aviation and one of the most outstanding and unique aircrafts in the history of aviation. The fighter stood out due to its quite unusual design, like the two vertically staggered engines, overwing fuel tanks, as well as the unique fitment of two air-to-air -air missiles on the sides of the forward fuselage. But first of all, the fighter attracted attention because of its impressive flight characteristics, most notably its exceptional rate of climb, ceiling and maximum speed. Making the first flight in 1954, the plane turned out to be unbelievably fast. The Lightning became the first plane in history that could go supersonic in level flight without using an afterburner. Something in fact so rare that it wasn't until September 1989, when the experimental F-14 Tomcat with a special engine demonstrated supersonic cruise for the first time. British pilots admired the Lightning's trademark tail stand maneuver, when you could climb almost vertically the experience that pilots described as being saddled to a skyrocket. The airmen joked that the Lightning needed its wings only so you have something you could attach the landing lights to. Lightning's top speed exceeded the speed of sound twice over, a number that is still quite impressive even compared to modern fifth-generation fighters. In addition to speed, the plane had a phenomenal rate of climb. It took the Lightning only 150 seconds after releasing the brakes on the ground to reach an altitude of more than 12 kilometers. Although long removed from service, the Lightning's maximum ceiling has never been released officially. Among other things, the Lightning was equipped with the most up-to-date and advanced weapon systems and avionics, 
compared to all previous British planes. The fighter was so advanced that it was even said about the Lightning that never before had a fighter been so dependent upon electronics. But unfortunately, like with all new technologies, reliability was not among its best qualities. It was exactly because of the electronics issues that one of the Lightning's tail number XM-135 had been with the 33rd maintenance unit at RAF Lynham for a long time already. For the unit's commander, Walter Taffy Holden, this particular Lightning became a real headache. The power supply to flight instruments in the cockpit had been constantly cutting out, so the standby system had to switch in, which obviously wasn't great to have in supersonic fighter. But the problem was that this issue would only occur during the takeoff run. However, while the plane was parked on the ground, power supply would seem to work without any issues. It had been several weeks already since Holden and his electricians began trying to find the cause of the problem. But every time they think that they have fixed the issue, the test pilots would again report the power supply problems during takeoff. On top of that, Taffy Holden was under constant pressure from his superiors. The main task of the 33rd maintenance unit that Taffy Holden was in command of was to prepare military planes like Canberras, Meteors and Lightnings before dispatching them to various flying units. But at that moment, the 33rd unit was supposed to win down after disposing of its last aircraft. Taffy's unit consisted of some civilian contractors that had to be laid off, and the rogue fighter, which had been upset in the timetable of clearance at the time, had it quite an irritation to box Holden's staff and his superiors. Taffy's unit successfully cleared and sent all the remaining fighters and bombers to the Air Force units, and only XM-135 stubbornly refused to get in service. To establish the cause of the electrical issue, Taffy Holden decided to conduct some ground tests that would simulate a takeoff. But there was a problem. Unlike other planes, due to the technical complexity of the Lightning, a qualified pilot had to always be present in the fighter's cockpit during ground tests. Normally, at Taffy Holden's request, the Air Force would send him a qualified Lightning pilot within 24 hours. But this time he was told that a pilot wasn't available for at least another week. Big pressure from his superiors, the long wait for a qualified pilot. Taffy Holden was in a tight spot. But one day, in a conversation, one of the test pilots at the airbase suggested, why doesn't Holden do the tests himself? Isn't he a pilot too? Although Taffy Holden was an RAF engineer officer, technically he was indeed a pilot too. In 1943, while studying to become an aircraft engineer, the Royal Air Force offered Holden the opportunity to go through basic pilot training. It was believed that an engineer and officer with a pilot qualification could see the pilot's point of view in aircraft maintenance matters with more ease. Taffy agreed and after taking a short course of flight training, received his pilot's wings. But Holden had never piloted a jet plane. His training took place in an old Tiger Mod biplane, which had a top speed of 175 km per hour. Sure, Holden also had some experience of flying in faster planes, like the trainer de Havilland Canada Chipmunk, which could reach 222 km per hour. But even that was absolutely nothing compared to the top speed of almost 2.500 km per hour that the Lightning could reach. But Taffy Holden, on the other hand, was not actually required to fly in the Lightning. To conduct the test, he would take the pilot seat in the cockpit, then put the engines into the takeoff mode, release the brakes, make a short run of no more than 50 meters, then press the brakes again and shut down the engines. Such a test would simulate the first seconds of the takeoff, so Taffy Holden hoped it would help determine the cause of the repeatedly occurring malfunction. On paper, everything looked doable, and on July 22, 1966, after receiving permission for the test, Taffy Holden took the place in the cockpit of the Lightning XM-135. Since Taffy Holden had no idea how to operate the Lightning, not only flying, but even how to start its engines, he asked one of his technicians to give him brief instructions on the engine's basic controls, and Taffy was sorely making notes on everything he had heard. During the test, Holden was supposed to push the throttles up to 90% of the power, and as he later recalled, it was by way of extraordinary good fortune that his technician also mentioned that if he pushes the throttles further ahead, he will reach the so-called reheat gate and throttles would then get locked in that position. Without going too deep into technical details, reheat, or as it is sometimes called afterburner, is a jet engine operating mode used to temporarily increase the thrust. Most often, reheat is used for accelerated takeoff and rapid climb. As some fighter pilots like to say when taking off with reheat, the aircraft's acceleration is so powerful that you feel like a bullet being fired from a gun. To disengage reheat on a Lightning, one had to feel for the gate keys behind the throttle and unlock them. 
But since you're not going to take off, you don't need to remember this, joked the technician. Luckily, Holden wrote it down anyways. Soon the lightning was towed to one of the out-of-use runways and everything seemed to be ready for ground tests. To connect some temporary wires that were required to run the test, the cockpit canopy was completely removed from the plane. For communication with the air traffic control, which was supposed to give clearance for each run, they were using a Land Rover with the radio station, which was parked next to the plane. After getting the first permission, the officer in the rover gave Taffy a signal and he gradually pushed the throttles, still holding the brakes. Then holding cautiously released the brakes. The initial punch from the thrust was quite remarkable, as Taffy then recalled. The plane rolled down for about 40 meters, then holding throttled back and applied the brakes. Well, so far so good, Taffy said to himself after the plane came to stop. The second run went just as smoothly as the first one and Taffy was about to do the third and final run. To the air traffic control tower, everything seemed fairly calm and routine as well. And since Taffy's first short runs didn't raise any concerns or danger, the tower even decided to allow the crossing of the runway to the Bowser with 3,600 gallons of jet fuel. In the meantime, Taffy saw another hand signal from the officer in the rover and pushed the engine throttles once again. But this time he mistakenly pushed them a bit too far, and all of a sudden they got locked into reheat. In the blink of an eye, while sitting in the Lightning's cockpit, Taffy became the bullet being fired from a gun. Two powerful Rolls-Royce engines in reheat mode began rapidly accelerating the Lightning with Taffy holding in the cockpit. Taffy tried to move the throttles back, but they already got locked in. Before Holden even had a moment to think about how to get out of reheat, all his thoughts were concentrated on the fuel Bowser that was crossing the runway in front of him from right to left. In that moment, nothing really depended on him yet, since he couldn't steer the bullet on the ground at such speed. By some miracle, he avoided the collision by a tiny margin. As Taffy later wrote, the time between finding myself in reheat and just missing the Bowser was less than half the time I have taken to write this sentence. But the very next moment he had evaded the Bowser, he saw with horror a comet from the RAF Transport Command that was taking off on the main duty runway, which Taffy was about to cross in a fraction of a second. Fortunately, he missed the collision again. In just a few seconds, Taffy was already on the verge of death twice. But his problems didn't end there. The same could not be said for the runway, which was coming to an end and very quickly. By that time, the plane had already gained quite high speed and Taffy understood that there was no chance of stopping it on the runway. Considering that right at the end of the runway there was a small village called Bradenstock, Taffy Holden made the only right decision to avoid casualties. He pulled the stick and the lightning soared into the sky. Once airborne, Taffy managed to get his thoughts together and finally turned off the reheat. The first thing he did in the air was search for the comet he had missed a few seconds early on the ground. After looking around and not finding it in the sky, Taffy was now at least trying not to lose the sight of his airfield. Considering lightning's high speed even in normal horizontal flight, it wasn't as easy of task as it might seem at first. He then began circling over the airfield, but with each passing second, Taffy Holden became more and more aware of the terror of the situation in which he had all of a sudden found himself in. He was in the cockpit of one of the most fastest and most complex fighters of its time. And by the way, he was in the cockpit without a canopy, which had been removed for the test. Since on the ground they were using only hand signals for communication, Holden didn't even have a flight helmet, which also meant that he had no radio communication with the airfield. Taffy could not eject, because the ejection seat had the ground locks in to make it safe for ground servicing. Taffy Holden understood that he couldn't expect help to come from anywhere and that his life now depended entirely on himself. The reality was that the one and only way out of the situation was to land the plane. It's worth mentioning here that due to the large wing sweep angle, Lightning's landing speed was quite high, which made landing difficult even for duty pilots, let alone ground crewmen. But Taffy Holden had no other choice left, and after making several circles over the airfield, he began his first attempt to land. The first two approaches were quite unsuccessful, because Taffy could not correctly adjust the speed and altitude. At some point on the second approach, he even found himself below the runway level after descending into a valley before the airfield. He miraculously avoided a crash, but the plane failed to land again. The third approach was more successful. The plane finally touched the ground and ran down the airstrip. Normally, jet fighters use a braking parachute to slow down the plane after landing. Taffy managed to find the right lever and pull it, but the plane, for some reason, was not slowing down as he expected it to. So Taffy then pressed the brakes as hard as he could. The thing is that unlike the early planes that use a tailwheel, the Lightning was a nose-wheel aircraft. 
so when landing the lightning using the same technique he was taught to land the old tiger mod, he slightly hit the ground with the tail bumper. Taffy didn't even notice that, but the hit was enough to break the rubber case with the parachute cables. So when Taffy pulled the lever, the braking parachute simply dropped out on the ground without any effect. Even after the landing, when it would seem that the hardest part was already over, Taffy was again on the verge of his death. Fortunately for him, even though he burned out the brakes of the plane, he managed to stop it eventually. There was just about 100 meters left to the end of the runway. The whole flight from takeoff to landing lasted for only 12 minutes, during which Taffy could have said goodbye to his life at least 5 times. After landing, the lightning was towed away to the hangar and Taffy was sent to the doctor, where he immediately received some sedatives. A little later, Taffy was also given the rubber parachute block from his plane, which has since been kept for years as a family relic. After a while, Holden was called to the Air Ministry. Given the circumstances, he had already said goodbye to his military career, so he did not expect anything good when he stood in front of Air Marshal Sir Kenneth Porter. The Marshal began menacingly. With the limited flying experience that you had, would it have been better to leave the ground test to an experienced lightning test pilot? Yes, indeed, agreed Taffy. Good. Very good, said the marshal. Well, then, take off your hat and take a seat. I'd like to tell you a story about my unfortunate flying incident in Mesopotamia in the Middle East. After the investigation regarding the incident had ended, Holden was not pressed with any charges. The consequence of the incident was only a slightly damaged aircraft, and technically, Holden was not acting against any current regulations in the flight order book. But after that, the regulations of course have been amended to avoid such incidents in future. Taffy Holden remained in his service, but he was absolutely not prepared for the fame that suddenly fell upon him. Since the airbase had many civilian contractors, it was impossible to keep the incident a secret. And soon the inadvertent flight at RAF Lanham became the frontline news in Europe. Taffy recalled that even on vacation in Italy, where he had been urgently sent away to hide from the public, he was immediately recognized by one of the hotel guests. Despite multiple offers for interviews, Holden tried to avoid any publicity. He refused all the offers except the one from Sunday Express, but only on the condition that instead of paying him, the newspaper will contribute to the charity fund of the Royal Air Force, which Taffy Holden remained with until his retirement at the beginning of the 80s. The Lightning Fighter with the tail number XM-135, in which Taffy made his accidental flight in 1966, got fixed and remained on duty until 1974, when the plane was transferred to the Imperial War Museum Duxford, where you can find it on display even today. In 2013, to the great surprise of visitors who were listening to the museum tour guide and his story about the incredible flight of Taffy Holden, it suddenly turned out that the old man who silently stood with them in the crowd appeared to be the famous Taffy Holden himself. A good sense of humor remained with Taffy even in his old age. Could you find the ladder? <laughs> So I can look, look into the cockpit there. I don't want to get in the cockpit. <laughs> <laughs> I want to look into that Holden passed away in 2016 at the age of 90. Although in a somewhat original way, Taffy for ages went down in the history of the Royal Air Force as an engineer who accidentally took off in a jet fighter. And that's the story. If you like aviation and stories like this, watch my video about the incredible story of Douglas Wangway Corrigan, the only pilot to fly across the ocean by mere mistake. That's all for now, thanks for watching and see you in the next video. Goodbye.